Shalom Aleichem, everybody. Welcome back to the, not the Ibn Abayt Midrash. We are visitors, we are guests in Eretz Chem, the Beit Midrash, where we actually spend our mornings. This is where our morning classes are held since the war began. These uh, Kolel guys are, most of them are e either in the army or you know, in the Miloim, serving time, and uh, they were very happy to host us, the Yibane group. And uh, so what we're dealing with tonight, okay? We're dealing with Parshat Shmot, and we're gonna deal with chapter, thir thir chapter three, verse 14. And I want those, to, those watching for the first time, we are using the Kliakar for the basis of our, of our discussion. It's intense when it comes to the text. It's uplifting when it comes to the spiritual principles. And th what we're going to discuss tonight is absolutely fundamental. Okay, We're talking about the name of God. When God appears and presents himself to Moses at the burning bush, and he says to him, Oh, by the way, there are links below where you can pick up these source sheets in Hebrew. If you want the source sheet in English, you have to send me an email and I'll put you on the list. But I encourage you to use and follow the source sheet in Hebrew. Okay? Um, so what happens in chapter 3? And I'm going to just read 13 and 14. We're really going to just deal with 14. But in chapter 3, verse 13, Moses says to God, Behold, I come to the children of Israel and I say to them, I'm going to present you, God, to the children of Israel. I'm going to say to them, the God of your forefathers has sent you to me. Now they're going to turn around and say to me, what is his name? Now, unbelievable, we had a non-Jew in our house tonight and uh, she uh, actually said, uh, my wife was discussing the difference between Juda Judaism and Christianity. And the woman said, what is your God's name? <laughs> So my wife, she heard my preparation for this year. She said, isn't that fascinating? So anyway, Moses, uh, Moses says, you know what they're going to ask? What is his name? What shall I say to them? So this is the verse we're dealing with. God says back to Moses, right? The Hebrew is, V'yomer Elohim El Moshe. Number one, we're going to deal with the very fact that there's a V'yomer, God says to him. And he says to him what this name is, who I am. I'm going to pronounce it properly from now at this point. Later on, you're going to see I'm going to change the way we're, we're saying it, and you'll see why. Eya asher eya. I will be that which I will be. And then it says Viomer. Why is Viomer twice? Because there's actually a conversation going on between Moses and God, and it's not in the script, but then he said, God said, so shall you say to the children of Israel, Eye, I will be, has sent me to you. Ko tomar livne Israel, Eye, shalachani aleichem. The next question we're going to have to deal with is, why is it that when God presents himself, he uses a, a double language? Eye, asher Eye. Twice the word Eye is used. But when he says what you're going to tell the children of Israel, he only uses one phrase, terminology, one name, Ehye. It was, you'll tell them, Ehye sent um, me to you. That is what we're going to deal with. And I'm going to try to sum up as we go along, because as I said, this is text heavy and could be confusing, but I'm going to try to make it palatable, edible, taste good, meaning translate well for everyone so going to the Hebrew, it says, Eya asher Eya. Now what I'm going to do from now on is pronounce it Ekiya asher Ekiya. Meaning it's like a name of God that we're not going to use in vain and pronounce when we're not using a whole verse. For teaching purposes, it's actually permitted, permissible, but I just want to get into the groove. So the Kliakar says, notice, the Achar in the latter part of the verse, even after God, God says, who am I, right? I will be what I will be. And this is what you're going to tell the children of Israel. That this name is only pronounced once, is said once, has one statement. That's who, said, that's who is coming. 
That's who sent me to you. So that's going to be what we call the first observation, the first question, the first thing that we're bothered by, or the clear cards bothered by. Furthermore, va'od mahu sha'amar. So it also says v'yomer elokim el Moshe. Right? We saw the word v'yomer. God said to Moshe. Now it says Moses' name. I will be that which I will be. The Kleokar says, Havi Leila Memar, which means it should have said, or it could have said, or it would have made more sense to have said, Vyomer Elohim Elav. As he says, don't we know we're speaking to Moshe? Why would the narrative then say, God said to Moses? Didn't we already said, Moses says to God, and then God says to Moses? Why couldn't it just have said, God said to him? Why does Moses' name specifically have to be mentioned? And I'll just read the words. Sharei im Moshe hu midaber. Was it not Moses who he was speaking with? We already know that. So Venera. Venera is the clear car's introduction to a, a, an answer. Or let's say insight into the groundwork for the answer. He says Nira, it seems. Lefi shalashon ekia that very language, Aleph, Hey, Yud, Hey, is Moira al Kaddish Baruch Hu Yihiyeh Imohem. This is fundamental in Judaism. It teaches, it reflects, it enlightens us that what? That Hashem Himself, He will be with them. Right? Ehiyeh, I will be with you. Moshe Haya Yireh Shnei Mine Yireh. Now, this is already getting into the answer and actually unfolding in front of our eyes. Why did it have to say specifically Moshe? Why did it have to say Yomer twice? Why was Ekia said twice by Moshe, but only once to the Jewish people, to Bnei Israel? Because the Kleokar is making the statement that Moses was afraid of or concerned about two things. Moshe Hoya Yire Shnei Mine Yire. He had two fears. Achat, the first fear, shelo yinazek bishlichut zu, that he himself personally would not be damaged by this uh, mission, by being sent to Egypt. I mean, can you imagine? Egypt, nobody escapes. It's very tough over there. The slavery, the servitude, the lifestyle. And yet Moses is going to go down there Remember, he left. He was royalty. He never served a day in his life as a servant. And yet he's going to go down there and he's concerned for himself. Now, the Jewish people didn't have that concern because they were already there enslaved. The Hashniahi, what was the second fear that Moses had? That maybe, perhaps, the Egyptians would not allow them to leave. The only thing that the Jews, the Israelites, feared was that perhaps Pharaoh or the Egyptians would not allow them to leave. That's the only thing they were concerned about. Having any damage or pain or suffering, they already were in the midst of experiencing Al Kain Amar Kadesh Baruch Hu Moshe. That's why God actually says to Moshe, "Ekia Asher Ekia, I will be that which I will be." Kederek Sha'amar Lo Lamala. Very similar to what He said above, and that would be on the source sheet number four, uh, in chapter three, verse twelve. So we're only talking about the verse before. God said to him, "For I will be with you." Look in the Hebrew, Ki Ehiya Imach. I will be with you. So that's what he said already to Moses. Now I, did, I do think it's very important for us to read the Rashi on verse 14. It's very, it's fundamental. I think we should read it and try to understand it. So go back to source one. Asher, Ekia. Uh, sorry, Ekia, Asher, Ekia. I will be that I will be. So what does it mean, I will be? I will be with them in their pain, in their, their predicament they're in now. What I will be, well, that means with them in the subjugation by other kingdoms. Future subjugations, future exiles. 
God is promising, I will be with you now and I will be with you in the future. Very key. He, so Moses said to God, remember I said there's some part of the narrative that seems to be missing because the Yomer said twice, there must be a conversation going on. Moses said to God, O Lord of the universe, <clears throat> why should I mention to them another trouble? Maybe this is part of the answer, at least according to Rashi, why Eki has only said once to the Jews, but twice to Moses. Moses is getting the, the inside information. There's going to be more exiles. But guess what? Moses says, maybe I shouldn't reveal that to them. They're going through a really rough time right now. Listen to what Rashi says. Moses says to God, O Lord of the universe, why should I mention to them another trouble? They have enough problems with this one. God says to him, underneath the narrative, you have spoken well, so rather this is what you shall say. So that's how we should read it. Moses says, who should I say sent me? Ekia, Asher Ekia. And then Moses, underneath the narrative, is saying, one second, I understand. You're with us now and you're going to be with us in the future. Exiles. You think they really need to hear that right now? God, and and um, God says back to Moses, you have spoken well. Rather, this is what you should say, meaning only Ekia once. I'm just concerned. Just let them be concerned about getting out of the present exile. Don't put on them this additional future uh, redemptions because that means there's future exiles, right? There's future redemptions, there's future exiles. And you're right, that's not necessary to reveal to them right now. <coughs> and Rashi also says, not that Moses, God forbid, outsmarted God, but he didn't understand what God meant because originally when God said, I will be what I will be, he did tell this to Moses alone. He did not mean that he should tell it to Israel. This is the meaning of, yeah, you have spoken well. That was my original intention, God's telling him. I never meant for you to tell them, Ekia, Asher, Ekia. But rather, you should not tell them such things to the children of Israel. Just rather, the only thing you need to send, say to the children of Israel is, Ekia sent you. Okay, I'm glad that we read that um, Rashi. I do think it's important to read the Rashi on the verse we just read also in, in chapter 3, verse 12, in number 4, where it says, For I will be with you. The Rashi says, when it says, for I will be with you, God answered his former question first, meaning the first question, and then the second question last. Remember, you said to, you said to me, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? So guess what? This mission is not yours, Moses. It's mine, for I will be with you. And we're going to talk about this whole idea. When we go into exile, Hashem, the Shekinah, so to speak, comes down with us. And we're going to see that too. This very vision that you see, that you have seen in this burning bush, is a sign for you that it was I who sent you, and you will succeed in my mission that I am able to save you. Just as you saw the thorn bush performing my mission and not being harmed, which was one of your fears, you will Go on my mission and not be harmed, just as this bush is burning and is not being consumed. You will not be harmed either. Now, concerning what you asked, God speaking to Moses, you asked, what merit do the Israelites have that they should get out of Egypt? So I have a great thing dependent on this exodus. For at the end of three months, they're going to go to receive the Torah on this very mountain. Another explanation, for I will be with you, Namely, that you will succeed in your mission on which I am sending you is the sign for you for another promise, which I promise you, namely, that when you take them out of Egypt and you serve God on this mountain, you will receive the Torah on it, and it is this merit that I'm going to stand up for Israel. Okay, let's go back into the Kleokar. I think those Rashis are fundamental. The last thing we left off was that Moses had two fears, Israel had only one. The fear of Moses was twofold. Am I, Moses, going to get harmed? And are we eventually going to leave Egypt or not? And the only concern for the Jews was whether or not they're going to get left, taken out of Egypt. And we said, that's why God says twice to Moses, like we saw above in 3.12, where he says, I will be with you. Ki beklal kol Yisrael. This actually includes all of the Jewish people. 
That's the answer. I'm going to be with you, but it includes everybody. Shalom yazikum hamitzrayim v'yanichum letzayt. That you, they will not be harmed, and they will be able to leave Egypt. Avol Yisrael, but when it comes to speaking to the Jewish people, this is all you're supposed to say to them. Ekya shulachani aleichem. It was only the one phrase of "I will be with you." Ki ein sarak lahudiam sheeya ima imcha b'shlichut zeh, avol Moshe haya tarik lishneim. Because for the Jewish people, it was unnecessary. It was not necessary to inform them that. That God would be with you in the shlichut. It's only you, Moses, that needed to know that. Moses needed to know both. The Jewish people only needed to know they were leaving. Okay, that's the first paragraph. There's a piece of a medrash I'd love to read with you. I didn't give anybody copies of it. I'm not sure exactly when it's the best time. But let's go to the next paragraph. And then for sure, I think at that point I'll read it. Ye Shomrim, there are some that say, Shemaimar, Shemaimar, that very statement. Asher Ekia, which means, right, God is, I will be that which I will be. It's actually giving a reason for the name. It's the reason for the name Ekia. Because what does Ekia mean? Hoya means past. The Aleph is future. It's really actually <clears throat> like saying God's name, Yud Kei Vav Kei, in a certain extent. We'll read it in a second. Why? ani nikra b'shem ekia. This is for the very reason. That's why my name is called I Will Be. L'fisha ani ehye v'hoive b'kol hazmani. Because who am I? I will be and I am present at all times. Ba'avar u'bahove what we call past, present, and future. In fact, the name Yud, He, and Avav, and He, is like all these together, Haya, Hove, Yihye. God is all existence. In fact, I really don't know that much about science, but from what I, the little bit that I've read, is that when matter came into being, that's when time came into being, and that matches exactly with our uh, Breshit. Uh, in other words, the scientific, whatever they call the Big Bang Theory or law or whatever it is, proves that when matter came into being, that's when time exists started. So too, that's what the Torah actually does say. So time and matter are intertwined onward. Now we understand why it says, third line down in the second paragraph, Kotamar Ekiya Sholchani. Thus you shall say to the Jewish people, to Israelites, that just this one phrase, Ekiya sent me, Ki ain't sorry kokach benetina tam lisra, because it's not necessary to share all those above reasons with the Jewish people, only that you're going to leave. Umashamar od. Now what else does it say? Kotamar livne Israel Hashem elokei avoteichem. Right? Not just the not just the God of your forefathers. Look back at verse 13. Right? The God of your forefathers has sent you to me. Okay. That is uh Avotechem. That's true. But then go to uh, verse 15. When God says in verse fifth, number five on the source sheet. God said further to Moses, so shall you say to the children of Israel, the God of your forefathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is how I should be mentioned in every generation. Now you may think this means the, the Ekia should be said in every generation. That's not true. But Elokei Avotechem, Avoteinu. The God of our forefathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, which we call Schut Avos, the merit of our forefathers. And when it says, this is my name forever, which name is it talking about, number one? And what does the word in Hebrew here forever mean? I have it highlighted. It says, Zeh Shemi Le'olam. Does it really say, Zeh Shemi Le'olam? If you notice, it's the vowels are le'olam. But there's a vav 
that's missing. Do you notice that? Le olam should be with a vav. And it's an ay in lam and mem, which means mute, concealed, not pronounced. So God says, this is my name that shall be concealed for all generations. That's how I should zichri. That's how it should be mentioned. Mentioned could be mentioned as in uh, memory mentioned, or even mentioned like physically mentioned. We're gonna have to, let's look at Rashi on Exodus 3.15. He points out the word olam is spelled without a vav, meaning it's concealed. God's name is concealed. Hahat li mehu. That it should not be read as it is written. That's why we do not pronounce, as some Christian sects, they even call themselves the J witnesses or Y witnesses, right? However you want to pronounce it, first of all, they're not pronouncing it correctly. But second of all, every time we come across the Yud in the Hay and the Vav in the Hay, we use a different name. We use the name Adonai. So it's Aleph, Dalid Nun, Yud. Um, okay? So just think about it like this. I, this is a side point. The, 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 the middle is Dan. There's a, a, a God's name of judgment, which is, right, Dan, Din. You have the Aleph, which, by the way, is like a Vav with two Yuds. That's how an Aleph is written, which is the Gematria 26, which is Yud K Vav K. That's mercy. And the last Yud is also representing of Yudke Vav K, be in mercy. So, in other words, Din is surrounded or sandwiched by mercy. But it's all emanating from one God. He has different attributes. And I think this is a good head, uh, segue into what I'm going to read from the Medra shortly. But this is the Rashi is explaining that we do not pronounce. This is from Gemara Psachim. This is, in other words, this is what we knew already at Mount Sinai. Yeah, when we were 40 years in the desert, that his name is hidden. We don't pronounce it except in the base of Mikdash at certain times. And the last part of that Rashi is to conceal, meaning the pronunciation of the way God's name is written. Yudke Vavke is to be concealed and not pronounced that way. This is how I should be mentioned. Rashi continues that God taught Moses how it was to be read. And we see in Psalms 135, 14, even King David said, O Lord, your name is forever. O Lord, the mention of your name is for every generation. Okay, let's go back into the Kliakar. The Kliakar mentioned, Elokei avotechem. So what does that mean? Ki lo yitachen shiye nizkar b'shem ha'etzem hazeh. That we're not, it's not possible that we're going to end up mentioning actually God's name, Yudke Vavke, or perhaps even Ekia, Asher Ekia, as it's pronounced, supposed to be pronounced. Except, how does God want us to think of him? As Eloke Avraham, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Yaakov, because we're going to see Schut Avos is very important. Um, Schut Avos means. That God is keeping his promise to us, even though we're not the best of children. And this is, by the way, during the weeks of Shovavim. And I suggest you watch Rabbi Breitowitz's class just on uh, the last, uh, just a few days ago, on Parsha Shmos. Zesh Amar, Zesh Mileolam. This is what it means, like in verse 3, chapter 3, verse 15. This is my name, Leolam, with the missing Vav, Hainu. Ekia, meaning what? This is my name that it's hidden and concealed. Ekia. Zezichri Lador Vador, meaning it was only meant for Moses and not for the Jewish people at that time, but only when it was necessary to reveal, which could be in our generation. This could be it. But anyway, what should we know in every generation? Shem Elokei Avraham, the name of the God of our forefathers, such as Abraham. That should be flowing on our lips. When we pray, this is a very common expression that we use, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, the God of Yaakov. Not using the Yudke Vavke, but using this, um, this other name, such as the God of our forefathers. 
Now, before we begin the next paragraph, I have a sheet that you don't have, but it's based on the art scroll on Chumash Mos, and it's a comment on this concept that it says V'yomer twice. Our verse is composed of two statements by God, each introduced the Yomer. We said it's in verse 14. No explanation is given as to why they are presented as two distinct statements. Rashi explains that Moses put a question to God after the first statement. The second statement is in response to that question. Now Rashi also explains why God refers to himself with the one word, Ekiah, I shall be. And in the second part of the verse, although he has given his original name, Ekiah, Sher Ekiah, twice, in the first part, Mo once Moses made this point, God explained to him that he had never intended that the longer name, which alludes to future calamities, be revealed at this point to the children of Israel. So Ekiah, Sher Ekiah, is only told to Moses, revealing future redemptions, but future calamities, uh, exiles, and it wasn't necessary to reveal to Jewish people at that time. Now, although he revealed it to Moses, he meant that only the shorter name was to be revealed to the people at this time. Okay, so let's go through the next paragraph, and then I'm hopefully going to get to that medrash. Lefi nir lefarish, li nir lefarish. So the clear car says, it seems to me to explain the following. Ki lefi shashem ekiah, the actual name I will be, is Nigzar Milashan Havaya, right? Aleph He Yud He is Nigzar. It's like comes from the same root. It's somehow rooted, and the expression is the same as the word Havaya. Havaya literally means existence, meaning past, present, future, all existence. Umoira al Hanitz This reflects regarding his, I would say, eternality, but everyone translates it as immortality. See, immortality to me usually used uh, for an expression of human beings. We don't think of God as being immortal, but whatever that means, it means eternal. So that's what it means. We're explaining the same thing, really getting into our kishkas, these words that who is Hashem, who is the blessed Holy Be One Be He? He was, He is, and He will be. And that's why it says, Al Amar, Zesh Mi Leolam. This is my name forever. Meaning what? Ratzal Omar. Zesh Mi Moira Shani Leolam. That it, I am forever. But what does it mean forever? Ratzal Omar, Mina Oilam Viada Oilam Mitsiyoti Shava. God is saying, from before the world was created, until after the world is not created anymore, I exist. I exist consistently. There's no ups and downs. There's no change. God does not change. Okay? That's what it means. Zeshmi le'olam. Zezichri l'dor v'dor. This is my name for generation to generation. Zesh amarti shani nikra elke Avraham Yitzhak v'yakov. When it says, I am, this is my name, you should be remembered in every generation, this is what it means that I should be called the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob in every generation. That's what you should have constantly flowing on your lips. That's my name. Moira, to teach what? It's not alone that I am equal, you know, equally existence from the aspect who I am in every generation, every time. Ella afilu shebekol hazmanim, but even in every time, Yizaker shmi al yirei Hashem, but rather shall be mentioned my name on those that fear Hashem, the choshve shemo, and they consider his name, bekol dor vador shava v'shava. Um, and that's similar to what's written in Malachi, that's the prophet Malachi, if you look at number eight. It says, then the God-fearing men spoke to one another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for those who feared the Lord and those who valued his name highly. In Hebrew, Zikron Lefanov Liyirei Hashem Lechoshvei Shemo. I think it's important to read this Rashi as well. Um, 
I retort, when God spoke to the God-fearing people, uh, sorry, then the God-fearing people spoke, sorry, I retort upon your words then, when the wicked commit evil, and the good go about in anxious worry because of me, then the God-fearing men spoke to one another not to adopt their evil ways, as for me, their words are not forgotten to me, for although I do not hasten to visit retribution, I have hearkened and heard, and I have commanded that a book of remembrance be written for them. Their words shall be preserved for me. We think about this on Rosh Hashanah. We speak about being written in a book of life. Who is written in the book of life? Those who fear God. Those who what? Who are choshvei shamo, who consider his name. And it's not just talking about Jews. Non-Jews also have an opportunity to fear Hashem and have everlasting life. Back into the clear card. <clears throat> the last thing we read, like this. This is really the last part of what we were saying. Who are those people who are so holy that Hashem is going to give, grant them eternal bliss these are like the sons, the children who are holding on to the actions of their forefathers, their holy forefathers. When we act like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I would say the same thing for non-Jews, that if you accept the Torah as the truth, the word of God, and you want to live a moral life and accept the seven Noahide laws and perhaps even become much more pious and take on additional, I'm going to call them chumras, but additional stringencies, uh, you don't have to be as stringent as the Jews in many cases, but if you want to try to make yourself pious means going beyond the letter of the law. That's really what it means, a chassid. And I know plenty of righteous non-Jews who do take upon themselves certain things to take, we'll call it the spirit of the law, or going beyond the letter of the law. God is saying, just like I treated, just like I performed for Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Shinikreti bishmi, that I was called and by my name, I'll call echad the echad bifneatsmo. Each one called calls me that way. Kach the called dorvador, so to every gen future generation. Yezacher shmi, they'll remember, they'll, they'll mention my name. I'll call has redeem asher shem koire on all the remnants, all the future people that, that survive who call by the name of God. And this is what it means, zezichri. Dor Vador. At this point, I would like to read certain parts of this medrash. It will take a lot of time, and we have still one more paragraph, but I think it's fundamental. This is in Shmos Rabbah, and um, it's, you don't have it. It's um, chapter 3, uh, um, part, num paragraph number 6. So it mentions about this idea of the Omer Lukim Moshe. God spoke to Moses. So I just want to mention, right, we had this statement, like, what is God's name? How come God has many names? And yet he says, this is my real name, right? So, Rabbi, Rabbi Abba Bar Mamel said, the Holy One blessed me, said to Moses, you wish to know my great name, but I don't want to tell it to you. What am I? I am called according to my deeds. So, God is unknowable. His real true essence is unknowable. We only know him through his attributes and his deeds. But if you say this is who God is when he's acting a certain way, you're making a big mistake because that's only a character of the many character traits that he encompasses. In fact, they are, I would say, unlimited. And if you limit it to even just one, obviously you're, limiting God, you're attributing a limit to God. But... I am called according to my deeds. Sometimes I'm called Kal Shakai. Sometimes I'm called Sivakot. Sometimes I'm called Elohim. And sometimes I'm called Hashem Yudke Vavke. And the Medrash explains. When I'm judging my creations, I'm called Elohim. When I'm raging war against the wicked, I'm called Sivakot. When I suspend judgment for a person's sins, meaning I'm withholding the punishment he deserves, I'm called Kal Shakai. When I'm being merciful towards my world, I'm called Yudke Vavke. Okay? Now, that name, Yudke Vavke, represents nothing other than the attribute of mercy. 
as we know from the 13 attributes of mercy, Hashem Hashem, Kel Rachel V'chanun. But then the last piece, it says, this is what it means when it says, I will be as I shall be, means it's telling you, I am according to my deeds. You call me, I am called according to my deeds. One little point here in the note, Nefesh Chaim cites our Midrash as illustrating the point that none of God's names, even the Yudke Vavke, the Tetramgrammaton, are reflective, reflective of his essence, which is completely beyond our ken. I don't know what ken means, but I imagine it means our ability to understand, imagination. You heard the word ken, K-E-N? Beyond our ken. They are all reflective only of how he relates to our world or of his connection to the higher spiritual worlds that form part of creation. Besides that, there's tons more stuff, but I'm going to get back into the last paragraph. Now the clear car, now the clear car is going to discuss something that is in Yechesko. What happened to my sheets? Here it is. So we're going to find this on page three, and it's number nine. When we were in Egypt, you know what we were? We were idol worshippers. We were evil. We did certain things that merited for us to be redeemed. Okay? We kept our language. We kept our names. What does that have to do with anything? Because the Jewish names, as we saw, Reuven, Shimon, Levi, all the Jewish names of the tribes all reflected hope in redemption. So if we kept our names but didn't keep our language, the names wouldn't have meant the same thing. And if we kept the language but not the names, that means we would have given up hope. The fact that we kept both, the names are redemptive, and the language translation of the name is redemptive. So we wanted to be part of this mission, this godly mission, this holy family. And I think even now during the war, there are so many of our brothers and sisters who may have felt alienated or even assimilated to the point they didn't feel part of the Jewish people in a real way. And I think, well, Hashem has his ways, but there is an awakening. And we, those who are connected or feel connected or think they're connected, should reach out to those who feel or think they're not connected, right? Because they want to be connected and... Uh, <laughs> Let's not go any further, but Rabbi Breitowitz usually gives an example of Rafi, whose shirt's like wide open down to his, his belly button, and he's got a Jewish star or a chai or even a, a, some kind of gold mezuzah hanging from his neck, and he thinks he's, you know, connected. Well, guess what? He is connected. If he's willing to, you know, wear such a, a, a thing, especially in today's world where there's so much anti-Semitism, and he's willing to stand up for the Jewish people, or for himself, as a Jew, it, it says a lot. It says a whole lot. Okay, so we were reading Yechesko. It's chapter 20, verse 8. They rebelled against me, and they would not consent to hearken to me. They did not cast away every man, the despicable idols from before their eyes. Neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. And I said to pour out my wrath over them, to give my anger full reign over them in the midst of the land of Egypt. By the way, unfortunately, many of the Jews, four-fifths of the Jews did die in Egypt. Do you know, as I said, we were not tzaddikim in Egypt. Who was the one-fifth that was redeemed? It was those who wanted to leave. That's it. That's like a, almost like a moral choice here. Those who wanted to be part of the destiny of the Jewish people. Those are the ones that were redeemed. Look at Rashi on Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 8. But they rebelled against me. They're wicked. The majority of Israel who died in the three days of darkness. And the children of Israel went out of Egypt. Chamushim. Chamushim could mean one out of 50. Could mean one out of five. Could mean one out of 500. But one out of five. One fifth. Another idea is they went up armed. The word chamush means armed. They went up armed. But really we went up with our chumash. We went up 
with the willingness to accept the five books of Moses. That's a shot according to the Kliakar, which is absolutely fascinating. We didn't yet receive the Torah, but the very fact that you're willing to, that says a lot about who you are and who your children will be. Let's go into the Kliakar, last paragraph. According to the prophecy of Yecheskel, Asher Misham, from there you would understand, Mashma, that when we were in Egypt, we were evil and we were sinners. If that's the case, what merit did we have? I already spoke about the four things, but I mentioned two of them, right? So what are the four things? So we didn't change our names, we didn't change our language, we didn't intermarry, and we didn't speak Lash and Hara. Those are the four merits, but otherwise we weren't great tzaddikim. We didn't have any merit in our hands. The only reason we were redeemed then was on account of two things, and I want to tell you, it's probably the same today. I know we're doing lots of mitzvahs, we're really trying hard, but there are many people that are lax. Okay, we don't have a temple. A lot of us are not living in the land of Israel. We are in this room, right? But nevertheless, what kind of skut, what kind of merit do we have? So when we were only redeemed because of two merits, echad, ba'avur shemo ha'gadol, same thing is true today, on account of his great name, asher hu imahem begalut, kaviyacho, kemargish b'tzarotam, Whenever we go into exile, whenever we experience pain, Hashem himself, Kaviyacha, as if he also experienced this pain with us. In fact, I tell my students, we're praying, oh yeah, we want redemption, we want Mashiach now, but who do we really want? We want Hashem to be out of exile. We want him to be redeemed, so to speak. I know it's a very hard concept to get around, but you get up in the middle of the night and pray to get out of this deep, dark exile, Feel the pain that Hashem is going through himself and ask that he be redeemed, that he redeem himself, so to speak. Um, where do we know this from? It says in Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. This is in our Parsha as well. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their slave drivers. And what does it say next? For I know their pains. In Hebrew, Hashem himself is saying, I know their pains. Why was Moses particularly chosen? Many reasons, but one of the reasons, he went out and he felt the pains of the people. Right? How we should also as well, but especially feel that Hashem himself is in exile and that he should be redeemed. And don't worry, we're going along with him. Because we're davuk, we're connected with Hashem. Similar, it says in Joshua chapter 7, verse 9. Remember, Joshua fought the wars, and I think this is very relevant to now. And every soldier that I meet who is discharged for a few days on his say, chofish of however long it is, it told me when I tell him, Hashem Yishmar, Hashem is with you, he says, and these are guys that are not so religious. You know what they say to me? I'm, I almost feel like crying. They say, I know, I feel it. Can you, you hear that? I know and I feel it. Joshua chapter 7 verse 9. For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear and shall encircle us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? This is asking Hashem. This is asking Hashem for your great name. Right? What a chilul Hashem if we don't win this war. Right? What a kiddush Hashem. And how it's going to be won, that is for the whole world to see. How it's going to be won. I mean, when you, it's like mind-boggling. I talked about this before, but the Iron Dome, it's like Hashem is just swatting these missiles out of the air. We're relying on the missiles, the dome, or we're relying on Hashem. That's going to be the key. It's already miraculous that somebody even invented such a thing, and that it worked, and that it continues to work. It's an absolute miracle. Okay? So, um, what's going to be with your great name? So, it's not because of our merits, but it's because of God's promise. Remember? And, in the merit of the forefathers. 
That's exactly why it says, as Mo, God's response back to Moses, Kotumar, this is what you're supposed to say to the Jewish people of Israel. That I will be what I will be, was sent to you. I have sent to you. It was specifically this name. This name, which is Moira Al, it actually teaches and reflects this idea that God Himself is with you in your pain, in your exile. And further, it says, Kotomar, thusly you shall say, it was Eloke Hashem Eloke Avotechem, the God of your forefathers. Hainu Zchut Avos. It's the promise that He made and the, the, the life that they live. And it's these two merits, or two reasons, that if you put them together, that is what it's going to remove us from the pains and the troubles to the redemption and the relief. And that is the song that we sang at the beginning of this war, and we've been singing and saying and praying every day. Remember, I won't torture anybody, and I won't torture you any further. But we all know this is a real prayer. It's not just an NCSY song, right? We sing at my Shabbos table. We should sing it more often, but um, this is our real hope. So keep this in mind. It's, it's quite humbling. We say Tachanun on Mondays and Thursdays, right? It's not because we're tzaddikim. Who are we? We say you're actually talking in every day, but uh, it's not because we're so great. It's, there's a lot of other reasons why we are going to be redeemed. This is part of the, the plan. This is because there are Jews that are really Messias Nefesh for the Jewish people, as well as in, in terms of mitzvahs and Torah. Um, and uh, we should be um, not just proud in the sense that we are. I mean, every non Jew should be proud. I'm talking about the ones who are righteous Noachides, who have given up paganism and have held on to the seven Noachide laws, have held on to uh, the corners. As I'm watching people make tzitzis here. <laughs> like holding on to the corners of the tzitzis of a Jew and saying, I heard God is with you. I heard God is with you. Uh, uh, teach me. Guide me. So I think it's up to Hashem, right? We're doing our part. Bizrat Hashem. Hashem will certainly do His. And uh, the world will wake up. I don't know what's going on in South Africa. They're suing us in the world court. Listen, we don't even recognize the world court. But you know what? It's an outlet for us to get across the true message. And hopefully, I mean, there's so many avenues, right? You have uh, social media. You got the world court. You know, you got the Torah. This is the best. This is the best. You don't need to look up the newspapers. You don't need to turn on the channels of the stations. You just need to look into the Torah and you know what's going on. You know what was, is, and what will be. This is the holy name of God from the Beth of Reshit to the Lamed of Yisrael. Every letter, it's one long name of God. And I will be, which I will be, meaning as it unfolds, as God unfolds his character traits and his behaviors and his deeds, that's how we will know him. And with that, I wish everyone a Shabbat Shalom and a great life. And together we will win. I hope that doesn't get us nixed from YouTube. But that's the truth. Only through Achdut. Bezrat Hashem. Shavuot Tov. Shabbat Shalom. Shana Tova. Kol Tov. All good stuff. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Oh